Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the fourth working group meeting of the Silver Line Extension Alternatives Analysis. Uh, for those who may be joining us for the first time, my name is Doug Johnson, and I'm the MassDOT Project Manager for the C. I am joined by several members of the project team, including Teresa Carr, the Consultant Project Manager uh, from Nelson Nygaard, we have Gary McNaughton from the firm McMahon, Allison Steer, uh, from Steer Engineering, and then um, Reagan Joe and Amanda Pogenberg, excuse me, from Virginia Villa Associates. Also Thaddeus Wozniak from Nelson Nygaard. Uh, we have a fairly long presentation for you today. Uh, this is the first time we have been meeting, or have met, I should say, uh, since I think the last time we all met was back in um, October, I believe, maybe November. Um, so it's been a while. We want to give you an update on what we've been doing in that time um, and then talk about our alternatives. But before I get any further, I should turn it over to Reagan uh, to talk about the Zoom controls for anyone who's not familiar and then get into the agenda. So Reagan. Thanks, Doug. So um, hello, everyone. Um, so I'm first going to share the operating procedures that we've developed for working group meetings to ensure that we get to know and work well with each other. Um, these procedures are the same as our first meetings together. Uh, first, as Doug mentioned, this meeting is being recorded, so it can be posted on the project website. And there are going to be many opportunities for working group members to share uh, their ideas during the presentation. Until that time, though, as we go through the presentation, we're asking members to remain muted when you are not speaking to prevent background noise. We want to encourage you to know any questions or comments you have for the discussion segment of the meeting. At that point, please press the raise hand button. When we recognize you, you may unmute yourself to share your question or comment. Please do not type your comments into the Q&A as we would like to hear working group feedback verbally. And we are also using the Q&A feature for public comments and questions. Um, you're going to notice that the chat feature of Zoom is also enabled. Only working group members and project staff are able to use this feature. For working group members, if you are using the chat feature, be sure to select all participants. Right now, you see like the default is on screen. It says panelists and attendees. Um, you would want to change it to say um, all participants so everyone in the meeting can see your comments. If time permits at the end of the meeting, we will respond to questions from the general public submitted through the Q&A feature. If we run out of time to respond to those questions, you can always email slx at mbta.com. And now I'm gonna ask the working group members to take a moment to ensure your name and affiliation are displayed correctly and to make any adjustments. Um, and also please share your name and affiliations in the chat. And as I mentioned, be sure to select um, for all participants before you do that. And now after that very long explanation, I will return, um, turn it back over to Doug Johnson. Thanks, Regan. Um, so as I was saying, it's been a long time since we've all met. Um, we're gonna give you, an update on what we've been doing since the last working group meeting, um, and the last public meeting we had. We'll show you the tier two alternatives that we've developed, talk about the design assumptions for those alternatives, and then we'll talk about the methodology that we use for the next phase of the project. And then um, we talk about next steps after that. I think since we all know each other and this is a working group, we can be pretty informal. Um, we don't have any designated discussion time so please feel free to just raise your hands and ask any questions that you have as we're going through this. Um, we want, if you have any questions or comments or need anything clarified, by all means, uh, go ahead and, and interject. We're happy to answer any questions as they come up. Um, but otherwise, we're just going to run through this deck and probably take about an hour. So <laughs> please feel free to give me some breaks by asking questions. Um, just to remind folks, I know it's been a while, uh, the purpose of this study is really to assess the feasibility of extending Silver Line service from Chelsea into Everett and potentially beyond from there. Just so you can go to the next slide. Uh, the objective is to look at adding transit service capacity and connectivity to knit together Chelsea and Everett with 
nearby communities that are not currently well connected with high quality transit. I'm familiar with the need for this study. Um, recommendations have been made by prior studies for you know, dating several years back to the Everett Transit Action Plan or Mystic Regional Working Group Report, and even further back than that, recommending some kind of um, rapid transit service or Silver Line in Chelsea. So building off of those efforts, we have this study, and now we're getting into the second phase of it where we'll have full alternatives to, to analyze. Another thing I just want to note is that throughout the pandemic, um, bus ridership in Chelsea and Everett in the Lower Mystic region in general has remained consistently um, higher than in most of the other parts of the MBTA system. So, um, strong justification for taking a look, improve and expand um, BRT service in the area. Next slide. This flowchart is the uh, evaluation process that we're using. Uh, we started off by looking at all of the recommendations that have previously been made for being rapid transit-like service in Everett and Chelsea. Uh, we screened out the recommendations or ideas that didn't meet our purpose and need, and then we looked at the ones that remained. You know, some of these are recommendations for specific roadways. Some are just general, you know, extend service from A to B. Um, but we realized that there's many different ways that service can be provided. Um, and my headphones just died, but I think you can all still hear me through the microphone on my laptop. Can I get a confirmation from somebody that you can still hear me? Yeah, it's it's a yeah. little, so, it's okay. Let me, my audio settings. Okay, can folks hear me now? Much better. Yeah, better? Okay, great. Um, so as I was saying, <laughs> we looked at all of the previous proposals and then we said, if you're gonna potentially you know, create service or extend service from Chelsea into Everett, there's actually lots of different options for doing that. We needed to look at all of the different roadways that could potentially accommodate such a serv service um, and figure out what would make the most sense. So in our tier one evaluation, we looked at that. We looked at lots of roadways within our study area in both Chelsea, Everett, Somerville, Cambridge, and Boston to figure out where it could make sense to run a service. We created metrics to evaluate those alignments. And then after doing that tier one evaluation, we selected uh, the alignments that scored the best, put them all together into full routes. And that's what we're going to show you here today. So we have six alternatives that we're going to show you, and they're going to look a little different than the, the preliminary alternatives that we showed you at the last working group meeting. We can go to the next slide, which shows them. Oh, sorry, updates since our last meeting. What have we been doing all this time since the last time we met and talked with you before uh, we show you the alternatives? You can go to the next slide, Teresa. So we last met in either October or November, and in that time, we have been coordinating really closely with the bus network redesign team to understand their methodology for their process, um, figure out where they identified having service under the new bus network redesign map, and how any alternatives that we created would fit into that or, or not. Um, so we've been working with that team refining our service assumptions, the design assumptions for the different corridors that we looked at, um, and sort of figuring out what destinations we were trying to connect with service. Um, we also refined the tier two alternatives. And as I said, went through a process of figuring out exactly to the extent that we could, uh, what the operating conditions would be on the corridors that we're looking at. Um, and we've been working with all the municipalities in that as well. Um, one thing we wanted to note specifically is that we've been looking at uh, bus lanes on Lower Broadway in Everett, trying to figure out what um, bus lanes on the corridor could potentially look like. We developed a few concepts, did traffic analysis for them. Um, and that's something that we're advancing. The conceptual design of that is something we're working on and advancing as part of this process. Um, but there's a lot of conversations going on with all the municipalities for different roadways and what potential transit accommodations could look like. Um, 
under either the bus network redesign map or any of these alternatives that we're looking at. Next slide. I do want to note some key differences between uh, bus network redesign and the Silver Line extension study. Obviously, we are working hand in hand and coordinating with one another, um, but they are uh, different efforts with different purposes and timelines. And that's something that I just want to take a moment to explain for folks who aren't familiar with each process. Uh, bus network redesign is, as hopefully you know, it's focused on the entire MBTA bus service area. Well, Silverline Extension Study is really focused on the Lower Mystic area, Chelsea, Everett, um, Medford, to some extent Malden, Somerville, Cambridge, Boston. We're looking at that area really specifically. Um, Silverline Extension is also longer term than Bus Network Redesign. So Bus Network Redesign is looking at implementation within the next five years. While for Silverline Extension, depending on the alternative, implementation could potentially take longer than that. It really is going to vary by alternative. And that's something that we will be assessing through this process to figure out how long, if we're going to implement any of these alternatives, how long they would take um, and what they would take in terms of cost, construction, things like that. Uh, bus network redesign is also using the existing bus fleet and facilities. Whereas for us, because we're looking at further out years, um, we're not constraining ourselves to the existing fleet. We're saying, you know, our, our future year condition for all of our land use assumptions, traffic analysis is 2040. And we know that between now and then, uh, the T's capacity to maintain and store and procure more buses could expand in that period of time. So we're not constraining ourselves to the existing fleet. Um, and then sort of the last two points, bus network redesign is not necessarily dependent on having transit priority infrastructure on every single corridor, although there's still going to be a lot of that through that process. Whereas with all, basically all of our alternatives, we are assuming um, implementation of transit priority uh, to some degree or another, and we're kind of dependent upon that. Um, and then lastly, as I mentioned, um, our out year for our analysis is 2040. We're using the um, CDPS long range plan for that and projections for population growth and traffic out to 2040, whereas bus network redesign um, use location-based services data and existing demand to understand where the need uh, for better bus service is now and how to uh, reorient the map to serve that service. Whereas we're anticipating growth and demand over the next 20 years and trying to figure out, you know, in 2040, where is the demand going to be and how could it best be served? So those are the main differences, but these efforts do overlap and coordinate with one another, and you will ultimately end up seeing some similarities between them. But with that, I think we can show you the six alternatives that we've developed. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Teresa. So the last time you saw draft alternatives from us, we had been showing them on a map all as potential extensions of the SL3. Um, you may Remember, it looked similar to the two of these together, um, but all the alternatives started at the terminal of the SL3 in Chelsea and went to different destinations. Um, for those of you who were involved in the Lower Mystic Regional Working Group process, you'll remember that that report actually recommended two services, um, one basically being an extension of the SL3 and another service that uh, went from Everett to, I think one went to downtown and one went to Kendall Square, but two services sort of making those connections. So as we were refining our alternatives, we realized that it made sense to think about some of these as extensions of the SL3, but some of these alternatives wouldn't necessarily operate very well as extensions of SL3, but would operate better as a different service, um, sort of independently of the SL3 for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but after sort of working that out as a project team and refining the alternatives, uh, this is what we have come up with. On the left-hand side, you see there are three alternatives for extending the SL3. Uh, basically, each one takes it to a different orange line station. Uh, the top one is Mullen Center, the middle one is Wellington, and the one on the bottom is Sullivan Square. And then there are three alternatives for a different Silver Line service originating in Everett um, and either going to Kendall or downtown. So we've identified two options for going to Kendall, one by way of Washington Street and McGrath 
to Lechmere and then down to Kendall. And the other is down Rutherford and over the Gilmore Bridge and then to Lechmere and then Kendall. And then the last alternative for um, that different Silver Line service is to go down Rutherford Ave into downtown. Uh, we'll walk through each of these and talk about where we're assuming stops will be located um, and some of the design assumptions that we're making in these, but they are still being refined by the project team and we're, we're still working out those assumptions of exactly what the operating conditions will be for each of these alternatives. Uh, go to the next slide, Teresa. So I guess I could have gone to this slide first before I said <laughs> some of what I just said, but um, this is the, the same three alternatives I just walked through for extending the SL3, just showing them all on different maps so you can see them differentiated from each other. Um, they all start at the existing terminal of the SL3 in Chelsea, continue along the commuter rail right of way, up 2nd Street into Everett Square, and then go to the orange line from there. And then um, on the next slide, are the three, we're calling them SL6 alternatives um, because they would be a sort of line service that does not currently exist um, if they were to be implemented. And there's the three options are here. You can see the two on the left are an Everett to Kendall Square connection. And the option on the right is the Everett to downtown connection. Um, one note about that alternative that goes to downtown, right now the map shows it going to Haymarket, but we are still, um, trying to figure out what makes the most sense for a terminal uh, for that alternative, whether we should assume it would go to Haymarket or South Station, depending on what kind of uh, transit priority accommodations there are in downtown. Um, I know that the city of Boston and our team and the bus network redesign team have all been talking about uh, transit priority in downtown um, between North Station and South Station. So we're um, engaged in those conversations and are trying to work that into this process to figure out exactly where the terminal of that alternative should be. And I think now we're going to talk about the design assumptions um, that we made in developing these. And then we'll walk through, as I said, each of these alternatives one by one, talk about stop locations, what we think transit priority could potentially look like. Um, but before we do that, if anyone has any sort of initial questions about what we showed, I can pause here for a moment. Uh, if anybody wants to weigh in, but otherwise we can just walk through these two and, and folks can raise their hands as they'd like. All right, not seeing any questions or anything, I'm going to turn it over to Teresa from Nelson Nygaard. She's going to walk through our design assumptions, um, service assumptions, and then walk through each of the alternatives. So go ahead, Teresa. So Teresa, Teresa, can you go back at, we, we're having trouble hearing you. And I also think Doug's Zoom just crashed. So do you mind? Teresa, we still can't hear you. Okay. I can hear you now. Now we can hear you. Okay, excellent. I wonder if Zoom is um, having trouble. Yeah, if you could go back to, I don't know if you spoke on the over the previous slide, but we did not hear any of that. Okay, <laughs> I mean, it was just the overarching um, uh, quest, uh, what I'm going through in the section, uh, which is the overarching assumptions um, that, um, uh, that went into the development of the tier two alternatives. And then what I will do in terms of um, walking you through the six alternatives. 
All right. So um, overarching assumptions. The first overarching assumptions is that we're really going for bus rapid transit level priority. So what that means for the development of these six alternatives is we are putting in dedicated bus lanes wherever possible. And where we have constraints within the existing right of way, we are having a serious conversation about what the trade-offs would be in terms of converting a parking lane or converting a general purpose lane to dedicated uh, transit priority. Things that we look at there, of course, are um, the need for uh, parking for small businesses or the level of congestion. Um, can we fit in um, a bus lane at the widths that we need it to fit in? Where we don't have constraints, we're also looking at putting in transit priority as a way to safeguard against future congestion. So just because we have free flow traffic, if we have the width to put in a dedicated bus lane, we go ahead and do that, we make that assumption. And where we have to operate in mixed traffic, this is where we look at putting in transit priority at the signalized intersections. And the things that we look at here are queue jumps where at all possible, um, which is a way of giving a, a bus a head start by providing a special space in advance of the intersection um, so that it can be the first to go when the light turns green as well as transit signal priority, which is also a way to emphasize uh, transit movement, bus movement um, at the intersections by giving it a little bit more green time or a little bit less red time um, at the traffic signal. We also look at um, stop spacing, which is different from local uh, bus based transit. We're looking at stops that are spaced farther apart, somewhere in between local bus and say subway. Um, and we're also not limiting ourselves to the current Silver Line uh, fleet. And I go into that in a little bit more detail in the next slide or one or two more slides. Um, our overarching design assumptions, I think is helpful just to spend a minute on because these are the widths that we're looking at. All of you as our working group members, you know your streets, you know your streets very well intimately. And so you know the where we have right away constraints and where we do not. We're looking at existing curb to curb widths when we are um, putting in a transit priority. We are looking at a mixture of treatment types, some center running bus lanes like Columbus Ave uh, bus lanes, some side running um, 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 bus lanes like we have in Everett, Chelsea, Revere, um, through Boston, throughout the, um, throughout the region. We're looking at a minimum for a center running bus lane of 11 feet. Obviously we would like to have uh, 12 feet where we can. Minimum for a curb lane, a side running bus lane would be 12 feet. For general purpose lanes, if we're looking at getting an extra couple of feet here and there, the minimum that we put in for a general purpose travel lane is 10 feet. Of course, we take a look at the amount of freight that's using those roadways and don't go down to 10 feet where there is uh, uh, not the ability to safely do so. We're also looking at a bus station platform width, minimum of 10 feet. We do have uh, many of our alternatives. All of our alternatives at this point are also running in the commuter rail um, right away within the Newburyport Rockport line. And so here we're looking at a busway dimension of 33 feet and the spacing um, of 44 feet. Some operating assumptions that we're using. So some of the coordination that's happening between our team and CTPS is on the runtime. So how um, long or how short are the run times for the transit vehicles and how does that compare to driving from the same origin to the same destination? We are looking at a maximum operating speed for our buses of 25 um, miles per hour. Now, when we say speeds vary by alignment, what I mean here is sometimes we're operating on roadways where the speed limit is less than that. And so obviously we don't have the buses speeding or going over the posted speed limit, but we also max them out at 25 miles an hour. We take into account current traffic and congestion uh, conditions along the roadways. And we have parsed out um, a little bit 
based on the level of dedicated transit priority that we have at how close our buses are able to operate at close to free flow conditions. So what I mean by that is if we have a center running bus lane or a side running bus lane and we're operating on a roadway where we know we have congestion, we take into account that congestion, but we also take into account the fact that we are separated from it. And so we can assume that priority, that close to free flow conditions, but not exactly free flow, close, but not exactly. And for dedicated bus lanes, both center and side running, any transit ways that we have, we are assuming 95% of posted speed limits. And that's at all times, whether we're in the peak or off peak. Where we're in what we call a bus access and turn lane, a bat lane that might be on, um, uh, uh, like a side running close to the curb, uh, but we're allowing um, other vehicles to enter that lane in order to take a right turn or to access a driveway. We're looking at 85% of posted speed limits and that again is at all times. And then where we don't have room for a dedicated bus lane, but we do have room for a queue jump or a longer uh, queue jump approaching an intersection, we're assuming 65% of that posted speed limit. We're assuming an average signal duration in 90 seconds. We're also assuming that buses hit half green lights and half red lights. So we are accounting for some delay of buses having to stop um, at intersections. We um, are, give ourselves uh, transit, uh, some priorities, some time savings at signalized intersections associated with priority treatments. Eight, segment, eight seconds on average for transit signal priority, five seconds for queue jumps. <clears throat> our fleet assumptions, and I do have two more slides on our overarching assumptions, and then maybe I could pause for questions. Um, we're not limiting ourselves to the existing fleet, but rather we're taking a look at what the fleet needs would be uh, based on uh, the frequency of service, the span of service, um, and our overall run times um, on the routes. Uh, we're coming up with our fleet requirements for each alternative, and then we would build that into the app operating and capital costs. The assumptions that we're um, using are consistent with conversations we've had with the T in terms of minimum layover of 10% and a 20% spare vehicle ratio. We are assuming that where we do have stops, buses are stopping for 30 seconds to allow passengers to um, get on and get off the vehicle. And we are because, as Doug mentioned, we're looking at 2040 conditions. We are assuming that by 2040, we have all door boarding and off board payment at most of our stops. So why don't I pause there and see if there's any questions related to those overarching assumptions. Suzanne? Thank you. Um, you've talked about interaction with parked cars and travel lanes. Um, could you also speak to the thinking around the interaction with bike facilities, both at stops and along the route? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in some, yes, absolutely. There's a lot of considerations as to how do we safely operate both Silverline vehicles and bike facilities. Where, and you'll see this maybe an example as I walk through the six alternatives where we have dedicated bike facilities, we're trying to keep those in place and not touch them. Um, where we um, don't have dedicated bike facilities, but there's the opportunity to put something in, we're trying to put it in. Um, we, I would say at this point, we have not finalize the design assumptions for each of the specific alternatives that's happening after this conversation today and through the rest of the month of April. And so um, we'll have the opportunity to see if we have any spaces where we have constrained right of way and we need to have a bus bike um, facility, but at this point we have not identified any of those. Allie? 
Thanks, Teresa. Um, not sure if I missed this, but did you mention the frequency that you're assuming? Is it 10 minutes all day or? I should add that to this slide. Erin, could you come off mute and tell us what the, um, the frequency of services? I know we had conversations about um, a consistency with uh, like the 2019 uh, SL3. Yeah, I, th I think they were keeping it consistent with that. I believe it's about 10 to 12 minutes during uh, peak periods and then off peak would be 15 minutes. Um, I think that's what we settled on, but if, yeah. Yeah, and Erin, if you wouldn't mind just double checking that, I know you have it in writing. Um, so, and if that's not correct, just maybe put it in the chat. Okay, well, oh, looks like looks like Bruce confirmed that. So I can, I'll just okay. go ahead and type it in. There you go. <laughs> Thanks. Other questions? AJ. Hey, everybody. Um, following up on the frequency question, how, how did you arrive at the, fre the frequency or headways? Was that based on demand? Was it based on something that, something else? We were really looking, we, we had a conversation about just being consistent with the existing Silver Line service at mm -hmm. this point. Um, but I think we're going to be seeing through this process what the ridership demand is and to see if okay. we are able to accommodate it with the frequencies we have. So I think another consideration too is that if you're asking communities to, you know, displace parking or other curbside uses for dedicated lanes, 10 to 12 minute headways really is not enough to justify that in many cases. So um, I think we'd really be looking for something you know, more in the four or five minute headway range to, to justify some of that. Any other questions on the design assumptions we've assumed so far? And all of this is really to like just trying to rough out, you know, what our alternatives look like, how much space we need, uh, what the footprint looks like. Uh, we have to come to that level of definition to um, share with Bruce and the team over at CTPS and to do our, our tier two evaluation. Um, so it's it's what we call defining the alternatives. And the next time we get together, we'll be talking through the how they perform. Matt? All right, cool. Just got myself off mute. Thanks, everyone. Uh, hey, everyone. Matt Moran with the Boston Transportation Department. Um, two items. And I think we chatted about these a little bit before, but just want to get them out to a wider audience. Um, just confirming the orange line headways at four and a half minutes um, and the modeling just to conform with what we understand to be the sort of base case with the uh, new fleet. Uh, secondly, I think we want to continue to push on the idea of a Sullivan Square commuter rail station and sort of the multimodal connectivity that that would enable. So if it's possible to look at that and model in terms and understand what that would do for a connection there, I that would be useful as well. Yeah, so <clears throat> thank you for bringing that up, Matt, and for everybody's benefit. Um, we have a slide that we added on the future um, no-build assumptions, but we didn't dive down into the detail that you're asking for. So let me just you know, specifically say what we assumed in there for transportation assumptions. Um, we did for our underlying what is the, the backbone of the service that the Silver Line is interacting with. Um, we assumed Orange Line transformation, Red Line transformation, Green Line transformation, the vehicles that go along with those efforts, the capacity of those vehicles. We assumed that all of those would be in place and that the updated service headways um, would be in place as well. Um, that really helps with the connections between our build alternatives and other aspects of the MBTA system. Um, Matt also is referencing uh, the idea of a commuter rail uh, station at Sullivan. Um, that was not in our future no-build assumptions. Um, the reason for that is because we try to be 
conservative with what we assume is in our no build, right? Like, so it's basically like, what can we assume is, is built when we're putting the silver line in place? Um, and so we, we do tend to be a little conservative with what's in the underlying no build assumptions. And we try to include um, projects that have been built there in construction um, where construction funding is identified, where all the permits have been obtained. Um, and so because the commuter rail um, station concept at Sullivan doesn't meet those criteria, it's not part of our no build, but it doesn't mean um, that um, we couldn't think about it as a, in a qualitative way um, after we get through the, the tier two evaluation. And Doug, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add to that. You don't have to. No, that, I covered it. Okay, Jim? Well, I'm just gonna obviously second that, <laughs> what Matt said about the commuter rail. We did assume it in one of our scenario runs for the Lower Mystic Regional Working Group. Um, and I think it does have, you know, just good benefits. So anyway. Thank you, Jim. Other questions? Let me let me let me go on and we'll have another chance for um, conversation as, after I get through the, the six alternatives. Okay. So I'm going to go through these in the order that Doug did with his overview. And so the first alternative here is what we call alternative one, uh, which is an extension of the SL3 from its current terminus to the Malden Center Orange Line Station. So, you know, as, as Doug said in his overview, our first three alternatives are assumed to be extensions of the SL3. They all originate at um, the Chelsea station, the current terminus of the Silver Line, and they all bring the Silver Line to an Orange Line station. Um, so with Malden Center, we're in the commuter rail right of way to Second Street. We get to Everett Square via Spring and Chelsea Streets. We go up Upper Broadway to Ferry Street, and then we use um, Ferry Street to Center Street to get over to the Malden Center Orange Line Station. Um, for each of these, we have dots representing our presumptions for um, where the stop locations are. Um, we have a caveat for all of these um, maps which are that we are in the process of reviewing and refining and hopefully consolidating a little bit every time we're able to um, reduce the number of stops. We improve our travel times and it improves the performance of the alternative, but it's a balance because we also want to serve people. And sometimes um, that means that we need to add stops. So those are the conversations that we're having. We're having with uh, each of you uh, now, and we will continue to have over the next few weeks. Um, so some assumptions um, about this alternative in particular, uh, the length of the route is three and a half miles. Um, we are able to do a pretty good job of transit priority. Um, we have some parts of this alignment in here where we're in mixed traffic. So we don't have transit priority. This is just based on how constrained the existing um, right away is and what we consider to be too impactful of, um, of the trade-offs of um, travel lanes versus parking and um, uh, in general purpose. Ferry Street is another consideration. The constraints here is um, a very narrow roadway, so between 35 and 42 feet um, between Broadway and between uh, Center Street. And so we um, tried to make this perform as well as we could on Ferry Street by putting in a transit signal priority and queue jumps at the signalized intersections. But between those intersections, we are assuming that um, the buses are, are operating with vehicles in mixed traffic. Um, we have 10 stops here. So our stop spacing is just a, a nudge under four tenths of a mile between us uh, stations. The other big assumption here is Upper Broadway. We are assuming full-time uh, bus lanes for our modeling. Uh, and so Jay's uh, comment about our frequency of service, that's a I think a good example of the conversations that we have, the back and forth of how good can we make the service so that it can warrant, I guess, the, the trade-offs that we have in place. We know that Upper Broadway is a constrained condition. Um, and so um, 
going from part-time bus lanes to full-time bus lanes impacts on street parking. So uh, again, just a, a, a reason why we give ourselves the space to define the alternatives before we do the modeling, because each one of these segments uh, is a conversation and we wanna be um, thoughtful and intentional of what our um, assumptions are. So let me go on to alternative two and I'll just go up through all six um, and then pause again, we can have a discussion and answer questions. Alternative two is what we uh, call the SL3 extension to Wellington. So much of the same um, alignment here from the Chelsea terminal along the commuter rail right of way, up second um, spring Chelsea, except instead of going up upper Broadway, um, we go through Everett Square down uh, to Sweetser Circle. Uh, from Sweetser Circle, we go uh, along the Santilli uh, connector to Santilli Circle, then along Route 16 until we um, uh, uh, come off of Route 16 to circulate to Wellington. Um, here, it's the same level of transit priority as Alternative 1. We are assuming transit priority down to Sweetser Circle. The Santilli connector is one where I guess we continue to have conversations. Right now, our assumptions are that we're in mixed traffic. It doesn't hurt our runtime analysis or our travel time analysis because it's not a congested condition today. The reason why we have not converted space to make a transit priority or, or to create bus lanes on the Santilli connector is it could impact um, uh, um, bike uh, facilities. And so again, having that conversation as Suzanne brought up with her question about having space for dedicated bike facilities, having space for a dedicated um, uh, transit facilities, we didn't wanna impact that existing um, bike facility, um, but we continue to have conversations about maybe how could we squeeze them all in somehow. Um, we're also in mixed traffic um, from uh, the Santilli Circle until we uh, come off of Route 16. And that does somewhat impact our travel time, but it's a relatively short distance here. So this is a, a really short alternative, um, under two and a half miles. As I mentioned with uh, the general purpose mixed traffic um, for per certain parts of this alternative, we're at 60% transit priority. Um, we have seven stops and so our stop spacing is about four tenths of a mile. I would say that's about the average. And just to give you an example of how we are looking at squeezing in transit priority wherever possible, we are at this point thinking that we can fit maybe in some transit priority along the northern edge here of the Santilli Circle. Also, and Gary's on the line, he can tell me if I'm saying anything that's not entirely correct here. Uh, but we're also looking at the possibility of having a transit priority along this edge here, just to give the buses um, an edge through this, um, this signal and back up onto the Santilli connector. And what these purple lines with the arrows delineate is just that buses operate differently in the westbound versus the eastbound direction here, right? So a transit vehicle coming from the Santilli connector skirts around the northern edge of the Santilli circle um, and onto um, uh, Route 16, whereas in this direction comes around the south side of the circle and then up through the signalized intersection and back up over to the Santilli connector. Alternative three is um, the SL3 connection extension to Sullivan Square Orange Line Station. So same alignment to Everett Square, same alignment as alternative two to Sweetser Circle. Then we continue south on um, Broadway, lower Broadway in front of the casino over the Alfred Street Bridge and then into Sullivan. Our assumptions for this alternative are that there really is an opportunity for us to have almost all transit priority. Um, that doesn't come without trade-offs, of course, and that's why Doug referenced that 
we've spent a little bit of additional time here looking at the traffic congestion along Lower Broadway, what's anticipated in the future with developments in this area, and how can we fit in dedicated bus lanes of some type. We're looking at center running bus line, lanes as well as a separated uh, busway concept. Um, and, and yet also accommodate the general purpose traffic, the freight that uses this corridor. Um, we are also assuming two dedicated bus lanes over the Alfred Street Bridge. There's a lot of uncertainty about the future redesign of the Sullivan Square Orange Line Station. Um, we can't predict the future there, but what we can assume is that we have, or we're, we're choosing to assume that we can have transit priority getting to the station. We also can assume that we are circulating within the station and that, um, that same assumption uh, carries for all the alignments that serve Sullivan. Um, we are assuming that we are going to be circulating within the station itself. So as I mentioned, um, we think we can get more than 90% of this route in transit priority. Um, we are assuming at this point that we have eight stations. And so the stop spacing is a little north of four tenths of a mile, a little south of one, one every half mile. So now the last three alternatives are those that go beyond the orange line and either terminate in Kendall or downtown. And so this one, alternative four, is going to Kendall via McGrath. And so it something that's key here for all these alternatives is that they don't originate at the Chelsea Silver Line station, but rather they come from Upper Broadway. And what we're showing here as uh, uh, Glendale Square as a possible terminus, but this little pink arrow indicates that in conversations with Melissa and others at the T service planning, it could be that this service originates north of Everett altogether, and that would be outside of our study area. Wouldn't impact our tier two evaluation process, but it is something for that's important for us to assume and realize is that it, it could extend farther to the north. It is identical to alternative three between Everett Square and Sullivan Square. So everything that I just mentioned in terms of uh, Suites of Circle, Lower Broadway, assumptions over the Alfred Street Bridge, connection to Sullivan Square, circulation within Sullivan Square holds true as well. This alternative would continue along Washington Street to McGrath Boulevard. We are assuming um, a couple of interim stops along this alignment. Um, and then circulation at Leachmere Station. This is the new Leachmere Station design that we've assumed. And then circulation down to the Kendall MIT area along First, Binney, and Third, and then Main. This route is a little bit longer as we would expect, um, extending beyond the orange line at six miles. We are assuming that we can get some great transit priority along these um, portions of the alignment. We have 14 stops assumed right now, so that's the stop spacing of a little north of, um, of four tenths of a mile. I think I covered all of these, but the connection with green line and red line. Alternative five, and for all of these, and, and Doug mentioned this as well, who knows if it's called SL6 in the end, we wanted to make sure that we were differentiating it from uh, an extension of the SL3. This is a new Silver Line service and it, by this time it could be SL7 or SL8, I don't know exactly what it will look like, um, but we are um, consistently just calling it SL6 for this, um, this process. So this also um, terminates at Kendall, MIT, same spot as um, alternative four, but the way we get there is a little bit different. So it's the same as alternative four from Glendale Square to Sullivan, 
But instead of going Washington to McGrath like alternative four, this alternative is going down Rutherford Avenue, connecting over the Gilmore Bridge up to Leachmere, and then identical to alternative four down first, Benny third to Maine. We are assuming dedicated transit priority on Rutherford and we're assuming dedicated bus lanes over the Gilmore Bridge. So there is a lot of uncertainty about what the future of Rutherford Avenue looks like. Um, we can't predict the future, but we do feel that it is a safe assumption um, for us to assume uh, dedicated bus lines and bus lanes. And for the process that we have ahead of us, that's all we really need to do to code into our model to figure out what ridership, what cost would look like. So we are assuming that dedication. We know that the Gilmore Bridge is a congested facility. And so this is a conversation um, that uh, the project team has had, that Doug has had um, with others at, at MassDOT, the MBTA with the cities of Cambridge, Boston, um, about a policy recommendation or a policy assumption for us to assume that we can convert to, or that we can somehow create two bus lanes, dedicated bus lanes on the Gilmore Bridge. And we are looking at a couple of concepts for that, whether it be side running bus lanes or some kind of a dedicated busway. Matt, do you want me to pause here? Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, emphasize the point about Rutherford Ave. So we have received direction from our leadership that there will be bus priority on Rutherford Ave going forward. Um, we don't know exactly, to Teresa's point, what that's going to look like, um, the exact design. We still need to work a lot of that out, but that's going to be something that we work out over the next six or so months and obviously in close coordination with our stakeholder partners on this call and with um, members of the community as well. Thank you. For, um, thank you for saying that, Matt. Um, we did have a conversation about, you know, we have been on pause for a couple of months uh, while we coordinate with bus network redesign. Um, we don't feel like we need to continue that pause for the Rutherford Avenue um, process to continue, um, but rather making an assumption, documenting that assumption, talking with the right people about whether that assumption is a safe one, and then continuing with our evaluation. Um, so we feel pretty comfortable um, at this point with um, just assuming the transit priority on Rutherford. Um, let me go. In terms of stops, we are assuming an interim stop on Rutherford between Sullivan and the Gilmore Bridge. We are also assuming um, a stop on the Gilmore Bridge at Community College. This should be an orange circle, sorry. Um, but a connection again with the orange line at Community College, and then a connection with Leachmere and a connection with the red line at Kendall. Our last alternative, um, alternative six, is going into downtown Boston via um, Rutherford Avenue. And so it is identical to the other SL6 um, alignments from Glendale Square to Sullivan Square, Orange Line Connection. We then assume use of Rutherford Avenue all the way down over the Washington Street uh, bridge, bridges and then um, along Washington Street into Haymarket where we would connect with the orange line, the green line. And then yes, the city of Boston um, has a project underway which is looking at um, uh, bus rapid transit like facilities that would connect either from North Station or Haymarket or maybe both um, uh, down to um, uh, South Boston Seaport. So this route length is a little over five miles in total. We are making the assumption that we can have dedicated uh, transit priority for the vast majority of it. Honestly, 
we went back and forth on whether we would say this is north of 80% or even north of 90%. There is a lot of uncertainty, so it's probably good for us to be a little bit more conservative here. Um, but there is a recognition that we can make a, we could make a lot of this work for dedicated bus facilities. 11 stops, um, so we have average stop spacing of almost um, half mile spacing, which is great. Let's see, and I think um, the one thing to say here, the terminus at Haymarket, there are still several um, circulation options uh, that are being uh, considered and analyzed. And I would say in terms of level of certainty, um, we started with alternative one in terms of defining uh, our design assumptions. And so alternative six, there is still a little bit more uncertainty uh, for, for this one uh, than where we started with alternative one. So I think this is a pause point for a discussion. Other questions or thoughts? Maybe what would be easiest is for me to go all the way up to where we can see um, the alternatives on one map. Eric, and then Suzanne, and then Maria. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is really exciting. Um, I have uh, some comments about the alternatives, but before I ask that, just from a process question, um, is the is the idea that all six of these and I apologize if you said this all six of these will be modeled and moved to the next step or is there an attempt to winnow down from here. No, we winnowed um, so all six of these will be brought through the modeling process and the full tier two. Okay, and, and did you go through the, the metrics that will be presented is it like ridership and you did do that already. I, I... No, 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 uh, it's it's like a nice segue into our next section. Uh, oh, okay. to walk you through the metrics. Okay, I'll, I'll pause. So um, I guess just in terms of commenting on the different ones, I you know going back to the lower mystic study when we did some uh, you know high level modeling of different concepts, I, I do remember that one thing that really jumped out was that there was this kind of real desire line for people living in Chelsea and, and Everett to get to Cambridge. Um, and so I, I definitely feel like um, like I I, I want to you know, I, I, I'm concerned that by splitting some of these, we're not seeing that, um, that sort of one seat connection from like Chelsea to, to Kendall Square. Um, and I'd be interested, you know, to hear from some of the other, other um, folks in the meeting uh, about that. Um, but I, I feel like that connection, I don't know if it's assumed here that yes, that, that someone would take a you know, would, would transfer um, based on that. But I, I feel like that was something that really jumped out from the lower mystic study was that real desire line to get over to, um, to Cambridge and Kendall Square. Um, and then the other thing I, I am glad to see, um, I think it's alternative four that goes down McGrath. Um, I feel like there's a real opportunity with the design of McGrath Boulevard to um, to incorporate really good bus priority there. And obviously that alignment hits a lot of uh, new development that I think is going to take place kind of in the inner belt section of Somerville. So those are my kind of high level level comments. Thank you. I could just um, interject for a second to your, your point about the uh, transfers and the connection from Chelsea to Kendall. Um, we are, this doesn't address the um, point about one seat ride. But in addition to modeling all six of these, we're also gonna model combinations of these um, in case there was a condition in which a Silver Line 3 extension existed and one of these other alternatives existed. So I think we're limited in how many model runs we can do, obviously by you know time and budget and labor hours. Um, but I think what we'll end up doing is looking at the results of the SL3 um, extension alternatives and then figuring out which one of those we want to model as a combination of that and an SL6 alternative or two. Um, so that's something that we'll look at and then we'll get a sense of where, what kind of transfer activity we could expect between those services. Awesome, thank you. Suzanne? Um, so that 
pretty much was the question and the answer that I was going to ask about. But I, I did have one other question, which is, so when this is being modeled, is it is it overlaid on bus network redesign and and then removing overlapping routes or how does it relate? Doug, do you want to answer that one? Sure. Unfortunately, we are not able to model it overlapped on bus network redesign. Um, obviously, that that map is still um, being developed, and like the public outreach hasn't been conducted for it yet. There's still a lot of process to to go with that um, to finalize the map. So, we also I think the time and cost would have been somewhat insurmountable um, to try to code in the entire bus network redesign, especially under that uncertainty about what it exactly would look like and then overlay these. So we're using um, the existing bus network, but I think that a lot of the results are still gonna be pretty valid, um, despite the fact that it won't have that future bus network redesign condition, so. Yeah, because so. we're we, we're assuming all the future growth. Um, so, and, and we'll go into that in, in a little bit more detail in the next section, but, um, but we are looking at who we anticipate to be in the region and moving around the region in 2040. And so the underlying demand um, and connections uh, will, will remain valid. And then I had put a question in the chat about was SL3 alternative three looked at as possibly extending to Washington Street? Uh, to where on Washington Street? The new Green the, Line. The Green Street. Line stop. Yeah, that's something that we haven't looked at specifically, um, but I, I can see how that might make sense. I think that might be something that we can assess um, somewhat qualitatively but we can have that conversation amongst our team and see um, what we could potentially do for considering that. Yeah, because one of the things we have is alternative four uh, going beyond Sullivan to Kendall. We can take a look at along that route um, where the ridership demand you know, is, is coming from. Um, and we've got ons and offs that we can consider. So no, it's not a, a unique alternative, but we should have information that would give us a sense of what are the, the strongest portions of that alignment. Maria? Yeah, this is Maria Belen with Green Roots in Chelsea. Um, we do environmental justice, grassroots organizing in Chelsea and East Boston. And I just wanted to, I feel like Eric read my mind I, the folks in Chelsea are, have really uh, expressed very clearly the need and the desire to get to communities like Everett and Somerville and Cambridge directly. Um, you know, in particular, the first three options were sort of the focus of this process from the beginning, the SL3 extension and really connecting environmental justice communities, I feel like is critical. Those residents that are low income, people of color, uh, frontline workers living in Chelsea, Everett and East Boston, directly to uh, train stops or directly to other communities. So um, I'm just a little bit concerned that, that, that now there's all these uh, sort of three additional options that completely exclude Chelsea. Um, I think there are great connections. You know, we're always sort of in favor of expanding public transit altogether. But in terms of the priorities around communities of color, frontline workers, transit dependent riders, uh, I think it would be critical to include Chelsea to connect folks in East Boston, Chelsea, and Everett. That's helpful. And thank you for your comment. Um, I think the, the reason why we split the first three and the second three is a question of operations of the SL3s originating at South Station. And, you know, would the SL3 in actuality go all the way from South Station up to Chelsea and then around and back to downtown or back to um, uh, Kendall in Cambridge? Um, and would those trips be better served through 
a good transfer at Everett Square. Uh, but I think it is a, a valid question um, and one that, again, we can take a look at where we're seeing the ridership coming from and going to um, and see, as Doug mentioned, at the end of this process, um, we are assuming that we would have maybe a little bit of back and forth in terms of a hybrid, you know, like, is there the need to do like the best of all, you know, a couple of the alternatives and, and test that. So we'll have that information. We've got Matt, then Jay, and then Ari. Awesome. Um, no, really great work here, guys. Really appreciate this. I know it's been no small effort to sort of put all these pieces together. So I really appreciate the um, level of effort and the thought and, you know, all the due diligence you guys have done over this, uh, you know, this process. I guess uh, two points. Um, first off, I think it'd be great to consider what if the bus coming into downtown went beyond Haymarket. I think that might pick up some additional uh, ride or some additional connections, um, particularly at State Street and at Post Office Square and South Station using this new bus link that we are looking to build um, you know, or at least work with the community on, you know, sort of building across downtown. And then secondly, I think in particular for the SL6 alternatives, it might be worthwhile to think about implementing um, multiple of these because I can see sort of unique travel markets potentially. So obviously the Everett to downtown piece is, is one market and then the um, sort of Everett, Sullivan, Rutherford to Kendall, and then, you know, maybe the Somerville connection is another. So again, maybe being open to having, say it's like an SL7 <laughs> or something, in addition to the ones that you've identified here. So um, again, great work. Thanks so much for um, the sort of extensive amount of information here. And um, yeah, looking forward to working with you guys more. Thanks, Matt. And Doug, I don't know if you wanted to um, talk a little bit about that, but we, you know, we've had some conversations about what a locally preferred alternative looks like. And, you know, many of the ideas that we're showing here are good ideas. And is there, you know, still a, a, a need and desire for us to narrow to one, or maybe we have a couple of discrete options? Yeah, at the end of the day, I mean, we're gonna have the results of our analysis, which are gonna say like, if, the operating conditions that we assumed existed and the service that we assumed existed existed. Then here's what we would project for ridership, um, Mocha, things like that. Um, but obviously, what the real world looks like at the end of the day might be very different than that. So I think, or the hope is through this process that we end up av actually having um, lots of different pieces of recommendations that could be made for specific corridors or for service improvements that wouldn't necessarily be exclusive to the silver line and could potentially um, help routes that might exist under bus network redesign um, or routes that exist today. So I think Lower Broadway is a good example of that. We're you know, really drilling down into conceptual designs for Lower Broadway because we know that uh, bus lanes on Lower Broadway is something that might potentially exist in the future independently of whatever happens with the silver line. So we're hoping that through this process, we can identify a lot of those opportunities to make those improvements, um, whether they end up being parts of silver line extensions or not. Um, also to that point, as Teresa said, like we may end up at the end of the day, combining some of the things that we look at here, um, if we find some things perform really well and could be combined with each other. So the, the terminals that we're showing on these maps aren't necessarily the, you know, be all end all and aren't necessarily exactly what would, you know, what the world might look like in the future. And I think that there's probably going to be subsequent efforts as well to further uh, study and drill down into some of this stuff too, to figure out what um, will really makes sense. And obviously, as you know, Matt, um, the, there's lots of other processes that are going on that directly impact what operating conditions will look like in the future, specifically Sullivan Square, Rutherford Ave, um, First Street in Cambridge. There's all these roadways that are sort of in design right now or, or will soon be under construction sort of independently of this study. And those are all things that I think, you know, we're trying to, to participate in those discussions and, and help 
find the best solutions for those um, outside of anything that happens with the silver line. But all of that is to say that just because we've presented these six alternatives like this, this way, it doesn't necessarily mean that at the end of the process, we're going to say, okay, alternatives one and four are, or what should happen or anything like that. I think we're going to end up having sort of a, a smorgasbord for lack of a better word of recommendations uh, that come out of our process and what could potentially happen. So instead of smorgasbord, we might say vision. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Jay. Thanks, Teresa. And, and first, I, I should just say to Teresa and Doug and the whole Silver Line team have been um, working with us uh, very diligently on this floor broader piece that I know Doug you mentioned. I just want to give a lot of credit to, to all of you um, because, you know, we're sort of trying to jump the gun a little bit, um, but I also think it's really been a really important exercise to better understand beyond just the numbers of ridership and sort of on paper analysis, um, getting down to the, the dirty details of, of physically how to make, you know, at least one of these alternatives work um, is a really important thing. And um, for other communities you know, who, who might be in that, um, in that market to, who are thinking about other, other quarters, um, you know, definitely well worth the effort to engage with, with Teresa and Doug and, and Gary and, and their team um, to really start to, to, you know, put pen to paper um, a bit. Um, so that said, though, um, I agree with really everybody's comments. Um, you know, Eric's comment um, connecting, you know, Chelsea, Everett to Cambridge and Boston, that was really the, the lower mystic um, recommendation. And, and Maria, your, your comment about, you know, the, the SL6 alternative not including Chelsea, I think is a valid comment as well. So I know Doug, you and I have talked about this and, and I'm, um, you know, you are gonna do some, some mixing matching. I think that's an important piece. Um, so we'll look forward to that. Um, one, one just thing I wanted to say is, you know, I, I do hope that we're not, at the end of this, we're not looking at just one, or maybe, you know, one, one option, right? I, I think uh, my, my fear when I look at, um, this could be that uh, we might be pitting, you know, uh, community against community here if we're picking only the Cambridge option or only the Somerville option or only the Boston option. And that's not a place that we want to be in. I don't think anybody here wants to be in, uh, nor should we, right? So I, I think, you know, that mix and match is important. I think we, we all of us expect that, um, you know, there will be more, probably more than one um, recommendation or, or one corridor recommended at the end of this that, that can do both jobs, um, serving during both or more than two, I guess, but um, this is really critical. And um, I know you guys are going to get there. And I do hope that, you know, that said, you know, at the end of this, I, I hope we do have a clear vision too, um, that it's not 20 different options and, and they're, they're left to um, somebody else to, to kind of decide what to do. So um, that, that clear vision of of I think that original goal really of connecting Chelsea Everett um, and, and those currently underserved communities to the big job centers, big education centers in Kendall and Boston um, is the goal and it remains the goal for, for us. Thank you, Jay. Um, and I do want to do a time check. We have seven minutes left. Um, so we do have a couple more slides to get through. I'm hoping that we could um, go take Ari's question, go through the rest of the slides, and then take Sal and Jim's questions at the end. Yeah, right. uh, I think I can, yep. Um, really quickly, think that this has been really good, and it's, it's great to just the visuals here are really, really good at showing what's, uh, what you're looking at. Um, to sort of hop on to what Maria Belen was talking about, um, Chelsea to Kendall doesn't really get served here, you know, a sort of, I'm not going to say backwards, but going north to Everett to go south seems like a long trip, but that's a market right now, which is just really hard to do by transit. And with the new bus lane on the Tobin Bridge, which really does wonders at, um, at rush hour, I wonder if it might be worth modeling a Chelsea to Kendall via the Tobin uh, sort of straight shot to see how that would perform versus the other, the other options. And that's an interesting idea, but ultimately, I think it might be outside of our our scope and budget to do. Um, but it's something that our team can can look at um, before. So the the long story short for the next steps is just that we're going to refine the alternatives, and then we'll be modeling them over the summer. Um, but I think we would want to take the comment from Representative Di Domenico um, while we still have about five minutes left. So, uh, Representative, if you want to go ahead, you can. 
I'll be, I'll be very quick. I, I just wanted to second what Jay was saying, because I represent, obviously, the cities of Chelsea, Everett, Charlestown neighborhood of Boston, and Cambridge going into Kendall Square. So I all these lines are in my, my district. So um, it would be hard to pick between communities, obviously, and, 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 and having communities fighting for transit in these areas um, is not where we should be, obviously. So I know you're trying to make it work in the mix and match and trying to make sure that we accommodate as many areas as possible, but obviously underserved areas of Everett and Chelsea in particular have been, and, and Everett even more so, um, where they have no rail coming through the community. They have rail, but no stops, um, which uh, which is also an issue that's been happening for a long, long, for decades. So um, I just wanted to reiterate Jay's point that um, this process, I wanna thank you for doing this, but we should not be choosing uh, pitting city against city. So and then, I, then I have to get in the middle of it, obviously. So, and and that would not be uh, not be good for all of us. So, but I just want to just make that point and, and uh, thank Jay for making that. Thank you very much for your comment. Really appreciate it. Um, and I think Jim, we can take your comment too. And then if we have a second left, we can briefly talk about next steps. Great. Last word. Um, <laughs> now, real quick, I think everyone knows we're we're cities doing their plan Charlestown effort, um, which will have. Uh, working with the community revised land use and you know future kind of vision projections for build out and things like that. So um, don't know if there's an opportunity to try to get those assumptions into your work, but I think that would be uh, great if we could. Agreed. And I, I think that's actually a good segue to this next section of the presentation, Doug. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, Teresa, do you want to release? Sure, be happy to. So where we are right now, um, as I mentioned, we are defining uh, the six alternatives. We have not done the evaluation process yet. Um, and that's important because we do want to separate the conversation about what are we looking at from the conversation about how do they perform? We need to get your feedback really appreciate all the comments from today um, because we have the opportunity our analysis is a bit of quantitative and it's a bit of qualitative and so when we take your feedback um, we can be looking at some of these specific uh, questions that you asked today that you've put into the chat um, and that you sent to Doug after the meeting today as we go through the evaluation. Um, we have uh, put in a couple of slides here about how we're doing the evaluation. Our framework um, is really based on our goals and our objectives. Um, we have five goal areas, expanding mobility and access, advancing equity, improving safety, supporting climate change resilience and sustainability, and advancing feasible and implementable solutions. Um, ultimately, we are hoping to look at the various trade-offs of the six alternatives. And as was mentioned, none of these are bad ideas, right? So it gives us a sense of where do our capital dollars go first? Where do our operating dollars go first? And then having that vision of how can we you know, have multiple investments um, that we program in over time. Um, Jim mentioned underlying assumptions and the plan Charlestown work. And there really is a question of what is the growth of the um, region in the future? And so we did want to put in this slide um, that talks through some of our assumptions. Uh, we have the analysis year of 2040. So we're looking at a little um, under 20 years in the future. We started with the growth assumptions that were um, used in the lower Mystic Working Group um, study. And then we, we took kind of a deep dive on the land use side because we know that our study area is full of growth. And we wanted to be as accurate that we, as we can be in capturing that growth. So we looked at the development pipeline. And uh, here we looked at projects that have been completed, that are under construction, have been approved, or where approval process has been substantially com completed. And we had quite a robust conversation about regional growth caps. 
and we are suspending the regional growth caps for our analysis. And what that means is that we're allowing this region to grow as we really think that it is growing and will be growing. And that does mean that we are going to be showing many trips um, that are made on the system uh, via transit and other modes. Here's a snapshot of what was in CTPS's 2040 land use um, uh, assumptions, and then what is in our uh, model in terms of um, uh, land use assumptions. And you can see throughout here, we have a lot more growth in our study area than what was assumed um, uh, previously. We are assuming higher um, um, jobs and higher population and higher households. So as Jim was mentioning, in terms of uh, the land use assumptions, we do feel that we're being pretty um, uh, comprehensive there. Our metrics, um, we'll send out the slide deck after the meeting. We um, are at time and it's a lot of metrics, but we wanted to remind you that although we're using the same evaluation process, the same goals, the same objectives as we did during our screening step and during our tier one evaluation step, here's where we drill down and we get into a lot more detail um, in terms of our evaluation. And here's what we'll be looking at and here's what we'll be reporting out to you the next time we get together. So what we're doing next this spring, um, today we're reviewing these alternatives with you. We finish up the definition of our tier two alternatives this month, and then we begin the alternatives analysis in earnest late this spring. We'll be completing that work and distilling down the findings over the summer to fall, holding our next meeting with all of you uh, to present the evaluation results. Um, and separate from that conversation, because it's going to be a lot of information, a meeting on evaluating evaluation results and a meeting on what we do with those results in terms of recommendations, phasing, implementation, and next steps. We are assuming that that's going to take a little um, while, just going from summer to fall and into winter. We have a public information meeting. Um, scheduled for the winter to present our findings, present our recommendations, and then move them forward. So this doesn't become um, just an, another uh, a plan, but really um, uh, a set of recommendations that are propelled into implementation. Our overall project schedule, and then a big thank you from us to all of you. Sorry to keep you over, but I think that Doug and I are happy to stay on if anyone has additional uh, questions. Bye. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks, Doug. Group, before you jump, let's not wait three months, six months, or 12 months to define the future that we want. Let's recognize that key investment decisions on the regional mass transit network, on regional housing, equity, and jobs policy are advancing as we speak. It is of the utmost importance that all five municipalities on this call continue working together to some of the working group members points earlier to make sure that we are collaborating and growing in the same direction in venues like the Boston Region MPO, which has a five-year capital plan out for public comment quite soon this spring and a long range capital plan that will be developed this summer and fall. Our partners at MassDOT and MBTA are simultaneously working on capital investment plan efforts. We can all take the great ideas and represent our community's needs through these processes we can't miss key steps. And I also want to just make sure that our partners at MassDOT and MBTA continue to try to link and connect the dots of various efforts. We talked today about bus network redesign. I'm also concerned about consistency with efforts like McGrath Boulevard, but also Wellington Circle outside of our borders. These design projects need to be talking to one another. We cannot miss opportunities to link up and proceed with street designs that allow for reliable bus transit throughout the region. So thanks, keep up the great work and please reach out to Ali Clayman or myself if we can be of any assistance. Thanks Brad. Does anybody else have any, any comments? 
if not, we can adjourn. And if anybody has any um, additional questions or comments, please feel free to email the project team and we can respond to you. Yes, you know, I, just say anybody could leave if they want, but I just wanted to um, bring up Brad's comment in terms of coordination with other efforts. And, and we agree 100%. Um, and they are part of, I would say, our day to day um, interactions and conversations as assumptions that are being used on Wellington. Let's make sure that we're carrying them forward. McGrath, carry them forward. Silver line carrying them forward. Coordination is a big part of our philosophy as well. Yeah, to that point, actually, um, the Wellington Circle team and the SLX team have been working together with CDPS to make sure that we have the same um, or similar modeling assumptions for those efforts because CDPS is doing both of them at the same time. So we are <laughs> working very closely with a lot of the efforts that are going on right now, um, but really appreciate the, the comment. I think with that, we can adjourn the meeting. And if anybody else, as I said, has any additional questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, the email address is in the chat. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody.